Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Leanne McAdoo, and here is what's coming up on this Thursday, October 17th edition. Tonight, new Chase regulations are a war on cash and a war on small business. But Chase says, don't worry. Restrictions on you are to lower their risk, like Cyprus, remember? And TSA documents reveal that they know airport procedures are contrived security theater. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Yesterday, InfoWars broke the story that Chase Bank would be imposing capital controls on its small business owners. Well, Chase Bank responded to that story after it went viral yesterday by saying that concerns over the capital controls were an overreaction. While admitting that it is imposing limits on cash transactions and banning international wire transfers for business customers, Chase Bank claims the measures do not represent capital controls and instead are merely about streamlining and de-risking. The bank also says that it is removing the ability to send the international wires because there is no oversight in the form of a bank representative managing them. Because, you know, you're most likely sending money to terrorists every time you take your money out of the bank, so you must be monitored. Now note that Chase isn't concerned about the risk of international money being wired into their bank. They're only concerned about you sending your money internationally. Paul Watson broke this story on Infowars.com and he points out that in saying that international wire transfers are too much of a risk, Chase Bank might as well be bankrupt because it is telling you there is no money to withdraw. This is where the mega banks have wanted to take us all along, a total cashless society that destroys all privacy and allows them to fine and fee the general population into serfdom. But if you're like me, you're thinking, I'm not a small business owner. I don't have $50,000 in cash transactions that I'm making every month. This is not a problem for me. But it is a problem. It's directly a problem to small businesses and people just like you and me, even though we don't have a lot of money. If we go to the grocery store or a restaurant, in order for those places to avoid paying the fees that are going to come along with large cash deposits, they're just going to stop accepting cash altogether, which means a cashless society, all of our money would be digital in the banks, which means when we see the pending economic crash that's going to happen, we're not going to be able to take our money out of the banks. And it's actually just the perfect setup for the bail-ins, which is what we saw in Cyprus. But according to Chase, everything is fine. There's nothing to worry about. Their response was that, these changes were being implemented to better serve our customers. They did not explain, however, how blocking all international wire transfers would better serve their customers. The new restrictions are particularly ironic because J.P. Morgan Chase is a primary shareholder and thus owner of the Federal Reserve, which has been responsible for sending trillions of freshly printed dollars outside of the country over the last several years. There is absolutely no legitimate reason for why one of the world's biggest banks just restricted the outward flow of cash from domestic businesses to their international contacts, unless of course you stop to consider that the United States is and has been on the brink of collapse for nearly a decade. Capital control is an economic strategy designed to limit the transfer of money. It is a strategy implemented only during times of economic or financial stress and it is usually a precursor to wealth seizure by the state. But you say, it can't happen here. Well, you know what? It can and it will. In fact, Cyprus-style wealth confiscation is now starting to happen all around the globe. Poland said in September it will transfer to the state many of the assets held by private pension funds, which may be unconstitutional because the government is taking private assets away from them without offering any compensation. EU finance ministers approved a plan in June for dealing with future bank bailouts. They're forcing bondholders and shareholders to take the hit for bank rescues ahead of the taxpayers. A bail-in is now being organized for the oldest bank in Italy, and the solution to bank failure in New Zealand will see small depositors lose some of their savings to fund big bank bailouts. Even Canada's Economic Action Plan for 2013 proposes to implement a bail-in regime 
for systemically important banks. So what does this mean for us? Well, what it means is that governments of the world, not just governments here in America, are eyeing our money as part of the solution for any future failures of major banks. But you might be saying, oh, what's the big deal? We bailed out those banks that were too big to fail in 2008 with all that TARP money, and I didn't really feel it. Well, that's because we bailed them out with taxpayer dollars. The bailout is the banksters robbing us collectively and mostly deferred. They just add it to the national debt. But a bail-in is when the banksters are robbing us individually and immediately. They're going directly into our banking account, into our savings account, pensioners, if you're a shareholder, they're going to go after any investments you might have. So when we see things like uh, the banking industry requiring that all regulatory capital instruments include a mechanism in their terms and conditions that ensures they will take a loss at the point of non-viability, i.e., if they're losing money, they'll take yours. Why do you think they pay you 0.000001% for storing your money at the bank? It's not because they're storing, you're storing the money at their bank and they're holding it for you. No, it's because they see that money as a loan and you are just an unsecured creditor, which if they default, guess who's not going to get paid? Well, coming up, we'll hear what Obama has to say about the new normal. And then we have some... New, breaking here at Infowars.com, information about the TSA. So stay with us. Alex Jones here to warn you about some of the most important health information you may ever hear. I'm talking about radiation, radioactive fallout, radioactive particles contaminating the Northern Hemisphere. Conservatively, since the 1940s, the Northern Hemisphere of our planet has more than doubled its background radiation. In fact, that was before Fukushima exploded. Now the levels are going up and up and up. Fish are contaminated in the Pacific, and the FDA, the EPA, and others, they're not worried about it. They've been raising the levels of what they claim is safe radioactive particles. So after more than two years of research into how to protect my family, looking at all the literature, talking to the experts, across the board they agreed, iodine is key, but of the family of iodine, nascent, natural, non-GMO, non-factory iodine that comes from the earth is absolutely paramount for your thyroid and other functions in the body. The literature, the research, it's there. It's not my opinion. It is admitted that iodine is essential for the health of our bodies overall, and nascent iodine is the best form. Now, we're announcing the launch of InfoWarsLife.com, and we're going to bring you scores of products over the next few years that we're researching and developing. But nascent iodine is the first product we're coming out with because it's so important, and it's also listed as a fluoride detoxer. It does so many other things. Your body needs it, and when you don't have enough iodine, forget the radiation, your thyroid absorbs the sodium fluoride and other things. Nascent iodine and InfoWars Life Survival Shield in double strength at half the cost of the leading competitors. Please visit InfoWarsLife.com today. Well, despite Washington's resolution of the debt ceiling deadlock, the fundamentals for a potential to default remain unchanged. That's why a Chinese agency has downgraded the U.S. credit rating. They say the fundamental situation that the debt growth rate significantly outpaces that of fiscal income and gross domestic product remains unchanged. And they added that Washington's solvency was vulnerable as old debts were still repaid through raising new debts. Hence, the government is still approaching the verge of default crisis, a situation that cannot be substantially alleviated in the foreseeable future. 
So in other words, our biggest creditor has downgraded our rating and will now make it even more expensive for the U.S. to borrow money. But hey, what's the answer to all of this? I know, raise the debt ceiling indefinitely. Here's Gigi Arnetta to explain. Thank you, Leanne. So the bill last night basically put the United States of America into perpetual debt. Let me explain. What happens now is instead of waiting and deciding on a debt ceiling, our government will automatically default to a higher debt ceiling, which means we're authorizing ourselves to spend more money unless something happens in the House. So basically the guys up on Capitol Hill have a lot of work to do to keep the debt ceiling from automatically going up, which is crazy because who does business that way? And something else to look at. What are the Chinese and the other people that we owe money to thinking? It's like having a credit card and just saying, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and keep charging. And the person who's loaning us the money has no power over that. Well, in theory, the way we're doing it anyway. So I'm sure that the Chinese right now are frowning at the fact that we just think we can keep spending. Again, this bill is available online. Back to you, Leanne. Oh, but that's okay, just ignore that. It doesn't make any sense. But overspending is the new normal now in the Obama administration. And if you have a problem with that, King Obama says, ignore the naysayers. All of us need to stop focusing on the lobbyists and the bloggers and the talking heads on radio and the professional activists who profit from conflict and focus on what the majority of Americans sent us here to do. What are you still doing here? Did you not hear your dear leader? He said to ignore us here at the truth-telling media and just allow him and his ilk to continue doing the job that they're there to do. Destroy America. That's right, he wants you to ignore the fact that under Obama, our deficit is off the charts. And he wants to continue to just increase spending in his diabolical pursuit of destroying this country. He wants you to just listen to him and his mainstream media bootlickers and look away, just look away as they rob us and future generations of our livelihood and our sovereignty. He wants you to look away from the outlets that give you the cold, hard facts about what's really going on and just focus your attention on the media that wants to continue not reporting on reality. Don't believe me? Well. When was the last time you heard the mainstream media reporting on the debacle that is Obamacare? As the blob grows, AKA the US government, Obamacare will not go away, except to India, of course, because the company who's handling the healthcare.gov site outsources to India. Way to go, Obama, shipping our jobs overseas. And here's the kicker. Now hold on to your seats, because it sounds like Solyndra CGI is a Canada-based company that was actually fired because it couldn't deliver in Canada. CGI's federal parent company, Montreal-based CGI Group, was officially terminated in September 2012 by an Ontario government health agency after the firm missed three years of deadlines and failed to deliver the province's flagship online medical registry. John McAfee, who founded the cybersecurity company of the same name but is no longer associated with it, said, I'll ask you your social security, your date of birth, and an hour later, I can empty your bank account. The Obamacare websites, he said, have no safeguards. And the hardest thing to wrap your head around is the fact that there's so many people without health insurance and they don't have it because they can't afford it. And looking at the Affordable Health Care Act, well, it's not that affordable. So if you spend roughly $300 a month for your premium, you also have to add in your $5,000 deductible if you're looking at the bronze plan, and you're looking at about $10,000 out of pocket when you do the math. So what is a person supposed to do if they've lost their job? I mean, it comes from your taxes from the year before. Think about it. Does it really solve the problem of people not having health care? So before I go, marinate in this for a moment. The government's telling you you have to buy health care. You don't know how much it's gonna cost exactly. You're not really sure what kind of coverage you're gonna get exactly. You don't know how much you're gonna pay in prescriptions exactly. And it's probably gonna come out of your bank account, which means they have access to your uh, finances. Or maybe the IRS will show up at your door with a gun. I'm Gigi Arnetta for the InfoWars Nightly News. So Obama wants you to ignore the bloggers and InfoWars and Obama scare. 
But what he also wants you to ignore is the government's own assessment of the TSA. Infowars' Adon Salazar examined the lawsuit against the TSA of blogger and activist John Corbett. The TSA redacted what he learned in his discovery, but our writer Adon did a little digging and compared it with the unredacted Pacer.gov version, where the TSA admits what we've known all along. They are destroying our rights to protect us from a threat that doesn't exist. In other words, the court documents go a long way in proving the TSA is pure, contrived security theater custom-made solely to indoctrinate Americans through prisoner training into blindly accepting obedience to authority as a normal way of life. So check out that article on Infowars.com. It gets more in-depth to the blatant abuse by the TSA against our civil liberties. In the meantime, we are searching out Corbett to get him here in the studio for a more in-depth interview. Now, lawsuits like the one that Corbett launched against the TSA are one great way of activism, but another way is whistleblowing. So stick around because after the break, David Knight is going to be speaking with Stephen Cohn. Uh, he runs a whistleblower's legal defense fund, and it's set up to protect those who risk coming forward to serve you and me. Many anthropologists and archaeologists believe that before man even discovered uh, the power to harness and use fire, we were involved in agrarian activities. That is, taking the seeds of plants and then replanting them to produce more. The very foundation of our modern civilization and human culture is centered around the planting and cultivation of edible plants. Here are some of the amazing deals at InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. The Survival Seed Vault by My Patriot Supply features only the finest survival heirloom seeds for a robust and hardy garden, even in the toughest times. We also have starter varieties of the deluxe seed packages for fruit, salads, salsa, peppers, medical herbs, and more. Go to the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. And remember, the revolution against tyranny is growing. Introducing Pro One. All of your filtration in one system, portable, on the go. No more do you have two or three filters to just reduce sodium fluoride. You have a system that cuts out the sodium fluoride and up to 95% of hydrofluorosilicic acid. Advanced manufacturing technology combines silver impregnated white ceramic with new Aquamedics advanced media for removal of fluoride and other heavy metals, all in one filter element. It is the only one that does it and out of the gate, we have it discounted at 10% off with promo code WATER. This is the only system that in one unit helps reduce or remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, ammonia and chlorine, hydrofluorosilicic acid, the most common form of fluoride not covered by other fluoride filter brands, and sodium hexafluorosilicate. Get your Pro Pure with a new Pro One filter today at InfoWarsStore.com or by calling 888-253-3139. Whistleblowers are our first line of defense against criminal behavior in our government, especially. We believe that they're heroes, and we're going to be talking to someone tonight who has spent decades helping whistleblowers with legal advice and with several books that he's authored. Stephen Cohn, and he's with the Whistleblower Legal Defense and Education Fund. Welcome, Mr. Cohn. Hello, how are you? Doing fine. Now, tell us a little bit about uh, your organization and the services that you provide. You've got a legal defense fund as well as whistleblowers.org. Yeah, the National Whistleblower Center, I helped found it in 1988. We are exclusively whistleblower support. We're nonpartisan. You can blow the whistle on a Democrat, Republican, big business, whomever. We are there for the whistleblower. Our Niche, we're well known for the quality of our legal representation. We have a defense fund. We're led by lawyers. Um, I'm an attorney also. And 
for the last 30 years, we've been perfecting the art of effective advocacy for whistleblowers. You've written several books going all the way back to the mid-1980s on whistleblowers. And I guess one of the things that people need to understand, we talked recently to a whistleblower from HSBC. So it's, as you point out, it's not just government, but it is corporations and, and uh, illegal activity that people might see in corporations. But primarily here, we're kind of focused on government. And so uh, I guess one of the things that, that concerns us is that when people come forward with uh, criminal activity and behavior that they see, it's kind of a sign of just how perverse and, and uh, complete the corruption is, is that the, the government typically comes after them rather than correcting the problem, as we've seen with Edward Snowden. But what would you suggest to a whistleblower if they're working for the government, for example, and we can also talk about what you would suggest if uh, there were somebody that was a contractor like Ed Snowden. Well, the advice is the same. Uh, as you mentioned, I wrote the first book on whistleblower protection back in 1985. There was nothing out there. And since then, we've carefully worked this area of law, precedents, advocacy in Congress, trying to build a network of protections. There's now over 50 federal laws. Many cover private sector, public sector. It's a minefield. Some of the laws are powerful and effective, and some are disastrous. Mm. So our first step recommendation is know your rights. Most whistleblowers engage in what I call self-help. They just blow the whistle. It's the right thing to do. They see fraud. They see misconduct. They see corruption. And they want someone to know about it. Unfortunately, to whom you blow the whistle and how you do it can determine whether you're going to win or lose, maybe whether you go to jail, whether you collect a monetary reward. How you blow the whistle and to whom are critical. So one of the things we do through our books, our educational program, is try to educate people on how to do it right. Step one, know the laws. Don't think because you're doing the right thing. Some official's going to give you a high five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because you're, you're exposing people in very high positions of power, whether it's private or what, especially if it's government, you're exposing criminal behavior. If they're already behaving like criminals, you can certainly expect that they're going to come after you in, what, in any way that they can, right? There's no doubt. Many whistleblowers are naive. Uh, they think if they do the right thing, things will work out. Mm -hmm. But greed, position, promotion, what are the motivators of the managers who retaliate? It's often about really narrow self-interest. If someone has committed a crime, they are going to go after you. They are going to try to discredit you. On the other hand, even if it's not so extreme, if they just don't want to be embarrassed, if they don't want people to know that they messed up a major project, they're going to do everything in their power to silence you. And here's the worst part of it. If they can't silence you, they will try to discredit you. That's right. And that's what happens to many whistleblowers. They, before they know it, they've got bad reviews, they're being criticized. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy for a whistleblower situation to snowball very quickly in a way that the employee, the whistleblower, is often alone, lacks resources, is being overwhelmed. That's right. They're going to do a, an attack on you personally, an ad hominem attack. Destroy There's your no credibility. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's one of our major... Uh, objections to all this fixation on leaks. Yes, they're going after all the whistleblowers who they think leak, but most of my clients have been the victims of illegal leaks by the government. Hmm. And no one goes after the government officials who leak on the whistleblower. Well, the public's pretty familiar with Ed Snowden's case. What do you think about the way that was handled? Did he do it the right way? Well, the first is he did it a typical way. He worked, he witnessed information, learned information that he thought uh, evidenced serious misconduct, illegal activities, unconstitutional unconst violations. He went to the news media and he's created change. That is a very typical scenario for a whistleblower. It's also what I call self-help, meaning he did what he thought was the right thing. Mm -hmm. From our perspective, 
it's always better to take a step back and see what laws exist. Most whistleblowers don't. When they show up in our office, they've usually either made some mistakes or not, and it's our job to try to pick up the pieces. I don't want to second guess his decisions that you know might be used against him or whatever, but I will say this. We've represented people with top secret security clearances who have blown the whistle on top secret programs. And it's more difficult representation, it's more costly. Uh, our general means of doing this is through uh, disclosures to Congress uh, and try to create an atmosphere where maybe it's not the whistleblower who goes to the press. Maybe other people get the information lawfully and they go to the press. Well, let me, let me ask you about uh, it's a big problem. Let me ask you about the, since we're on talking about the NSA, there were four whistleblowers that right after September 11th, they noticed a sea change in the way the NSA was looking at data. They went from thin thread to trailblazer and they started internally in channels working on this for years. And eventually the government prosecuted uh, Drake for four years with 10 felony counts. Now he did beat those and the judge really dressed down the NSA because they were trumped up charges, but they still came after him and they didn't really get the information out there nearly to the extent that Snowden did, obviously, or only really, most people only know about them because of Snowden. They've gone back and looked at the history of this. So they went internal and it looked like they kind of did it by the book, but they were still attacked by the NSA. What, what are your comments on that? They're going after whistleblowers now criminally in a way they have not done in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's tragic, it's wrong. But I just, I just want to say that we'll go back to the first World Trade Center bombing. I represented the FBI agent who was in charge of securing the crime scene. And he was threatened with criminal activity. He was threatened with criminal charges for talking to my office. He was threatened with criminal charges for going to Congress. And we were eventually able to get the government to give him permission to go on the Larry King live show and ABC News and blow the whistle on the FBI and give full testimony. It took us about two years. And the case shook up the crime lab, but it was Frederick Whitehurst that had great impact. He was under a criminal investigation for years mm -hmm. for leaking, but we were able to get around that. Uh, so I'm saying is there are channels, there are means, they're very difficult to use. Most whistleblowers don't. What's outrageous here is that everyone has forgotten that in 1968, the U.S. Supreme Court held that government workers can go to the news media and blow the whistle about government misconduct. Yes. All yeah. of these investigations are acting as if that Supreme Court decision didn't exist. Yeah, and that's kind true. Of they're, to me, they're kind of acting as... Why this constitutional anyway? That's right. We're, we're out of time. I'm sorry. Uh, they're acting as if the Constitution didn't exist. You're right. Exactly. They're just ignoring it. And, and what you so, have to do is you've got to put yourself right there with the First Amendment and say, you know, we have rights to blow the whistle. OK, great. I, we're out of time. I want to encourage people to take a look at your book. Also, to be aware of your organization. Tell us again what the organization is. It's whistleblowers.org. And the book is The Whistleblowers Handbook. I urge any person thinking of blowing the whistle to get the whistleblower's handbook, the guide to doing what's right and protecting yourself. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen Cohen. Thank you for your efforts. It's very important work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Well, it's very important information for Mr. Cohen, and we certainly appreciate the work that he and his organization have done to help whistleblowers. Now, if you want to help InfoWars, you can become a subscriber to Prison Planet TV. Up to 10 people can watch that simultaneously as you watch it. It's a great way for you to blow the whistle on what's going on in the news in a way that you're not going to hear elsewhere. Now stick around. Right after the break, we have some more special reports. Stay tuned after the news for more special reports. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at InfoWars.com slash show. Can I ask you what else?
I was doing wrong? Until you, I can find out you can legally have a good so, so you can just stop anybody in the world for rudely displaying, yes. Oh, how am I rudely displaying a gun? I'm walking. My name is Jonathan Garcia. I'm with Open Carry Texas. And I'm out here today to show my support for Master Sergeant C.J. Grisham. The Master Sergeant who was unlawfully arrested and disarmed over in Temple. His trial starts today. How are you feeling about the proceedings so far? Well, it's all been procedural right now, just picking a jury. Um, again, uh, I, I don't think I have anything to worry about. The, the facts are on my side and uh, the case is going to unfold that way and I'm going to walk out of here a free man and then I can begin to hold the people accountable that put me through all this. They asked the jury who was familiar with the case who had seen the video, about <laughs> half of them stood up. I think it was more than half. I think it was like 80% of the people stood up and said they were familiar with the case. So do you think that's good, bad, and different? Um, you know, it's hard to tell. Uh, th there are a lot of people who are familiar with the case that completely believe that I'm in the wrong. Uh, I call them statists. And then there are those that uh, saw that I wasn't doing anything wrong at all. I call them constitutionalists. Saturday, open carry march on uh, in San Antonio, line in the sand. We're going to be from 10 to 1 o'clock. We've got over 1,000 people coming. And uh, it's going to be a great big event. All kinds of groups and organizations coming together to uh, spread the word about open carry. So be there, San Antonio at the Alamo, 10 o'clock this Saturday, October 19th.